Good evening and welcome to Channel 4's Censored Weekend, two nights of programmes which explore the boundaries of how far you can go on British screens. Right now, film classification in Britain is in a state of flux, with a new chief censor already turning heads by finally passing The Exorcist on video. On television, a host of new digital film channels are flourishing amidst furious arguments about what we should and shouldn't be allowed to watch in our homes. Meanwhile, the laws governing pornography seem as changeable as George Michael's sexuality, and the effective regulation of the internet as unlikely as the return of Wham! In the midst of all this madness, Channel 4 takes you on a journey through Britain's most convoluted moral maze. Coming up at 10 o'clock, an intimate snapshot of that strangest thing, the homegrown British porn industry. Then, in Don't Look Now, Amanata Fauna makes a convincing plea for censorship. And to round off the evening, two feistily skin-ripping horror flicks into which the censors have enjoyed sinking their teeth, Evil Dead 2 and Zombie Flesh Eaters. Then tomorrow night, a no-holds-barred discussion programme focusing on eight of the most controversial films of recent years, followed by screenings of Abel Ferrara's infamous Bad Lieutenant and Tinto Brass's arty exploitation epic Salon Kitty. But first, as the single most important figure in the history of British film censorship, James Furman, finally steps down from his position of power, Channel 4 takes you on a unique journey into the heart of the British Board of Film Classification to witness the passing of a legend and to join in the bizarre rituals of the last days of the board. The programme contains some violent scenes and strong language. I saw this guy get his spine ripped out of his back with a head on the end, with blood everywhere. <laughs> I saw this girl hanging from a tree with her guts hanging out. I saw a man walking around looking for his arm, which had just been shot off. There was this man who got shot, and when he fell to the ground, all this blood poured out of his head. that gets sucked into a fan and then it gets chopped into loads of bloody bits. Um, can I have one ticket for lethal weapon, weapon four, please? These teenagers have been watching films passed for the cinema by the British Board of Film Classification and its chief censor, James Furman. For a quarter of a century, his taste and judgment has determined what we and our children can see. Now it's all change. A new Labour government, new leadership at the board, and the end of Furman's reign. What advice would you give your successor? Um, don't let the buggers get to you. In the movie business, it's rare for people to stay in the same job for very long, but James Furman was an exception. He was director for so long that many movie makers, myself included, thought of him and the board as more or less the same thing. And he was so sure of his judgment that a lot of us found him arrogant and secretive. But how did the chief censor get such a grip on the British movie business? And how much of his legacy will survive? Furman's a passionate film lover. He has a genuine respect and regard for film. Um, and he's also passionate about, um, about the work. He would go down in history as someone who was, you know, who um, loved films, who was in, you know, involved with them, who was a, cult, you know, a cultured censor, not a, not a butcher by any means, but also someone who like, really enjoyed the role, really enjoyed being in that position, and um, really enjoyed the power. Any film could be cut or even banned outright on the chief censor's say-so. His team see everything, 
about 400 films and 4,000 videos a year. And if there's any doubt on classification, James Furman will decide. All, all this is relatively new. Um, when, we were, when I joined the board, the board was all on the second floor and it was a rather shabby building. And gradually we've taken over other floors as we expanded for video. And it was a slow process and a lot of investment in the fabric of the building, but it, it's, it's worked. You know. Usually we have two examiners seeing a film. If it's a difficult film, it's being seen a second or third time, there will be more examiners seeing it and members of management. And uh, I would expect to come down to the theatre once a week, certainly once or twice a fortnight. Um, start the day at quarter to ten. Often we start off with a pawn. We maybe have a couple of pawn takes that, that we'd spend our time getting down to British standards, which are very much stricter um, than the rest of Europe. Possibly a straight-to-video action thriller, um, children's material, um, like a few episodes of Teletubbies or maybe something like Barney or William's Wish Wellingtons, um, which I would always pre-vet if they were of any use to my own daughter. Um, and then maybe we'd finish with something like um, uh, an episode of Star Trek that was coming out on video, or something like The X-Files. Um, so a lot of it would be very routine. Um, most of it would be very uncontentious. Approximately 95% of the material would be very, very easy to classify. The, the, the two examiners that are in there, um, one was a youth worker um, working in the Asian community, and one was a teacher and a librarian. They're totally different backgrounds and they're working together and the complementary uh, things they bring to it are part of the richness of this place that we always, you know, we don't want two people there come from exactly the same background. After viewing we'd write reports between about four and six o'clock. We had to write a report on everything um, that we'd watched, uh, making sure uh, that we gave all our reasons for the classification decision. They have to do two things. They have to experience the film as an audience experiences it and then they have to analyze how they're experiencing it and decide, is that suitable for children? Is that suitable for, for uh, adolescents or whatever? Uh, is that suitable for adults? Um, and so they're watching, they're having the reactions and they're watching their own reactions. And it's very important, a thing like sexual violence, where the men say, look, that's getting at me below the belt. And uh, you know, that's not, you shouldn't do a rape so that it turns men on. You know. If the chief censor passes too many turn-ons, he'll be attacked for corrupting the nation's morals, failing to protect the vulnerable, or leading the impressionable astray. The controversies, however, keep him in the news. I think there's a tendency, when children behave badly, to look for, in my view, scapegoats. The board director says his chief concern is the type of violence that obsesses modern filmmakers. Handguns become a badge of masculinity in these films. And the study suggests that aggressive people like these are influenced by films like this. James Furman wasn't available for But the fact is that the censor and the board are not answerable to public opinion. That's just not how it works. And the system has some fierce critics. It's a self-perpetuating, self-appointing association. It is illogical and it works against the public interest because it leaves the people that are responsible for censoring films far too close to the film trade. You've got to remember that the censorship system in this country is devised in the interests of the continuing profits of the film industry. The film industry is not a courageous industry, it doesn't want to fight, it wants to make a lot of money and so the censor is there, not as far as they're concerned, they pay for him because he is financed, importantly, out of the money that they pay to uh, submit films. We work together, um, I mean, although we're the regulator, we have to have a working relationship with the companies and we also, obviously, I mean, the electricity regulator wants a, a, a successful electricity industry and it's part of our responsibility to see that the industry doesn't suffer because of our administrations. Yeah. 
My most recent production, In Dreams, is about to go to the board to be classified. The distributors have come in to watch it and they will decide what certificate will be most appropriate to sell the film in the UK. They will then do battle with the board to achieve it. The board charges £10 per film minute for their services. You are. The film features a mother who has vivid and violent premonitions, potentially a difficult subject for the board. I think it's going to get quite a uh, high censorship classification. So there's a fairly heavy fuck count. Oh, yeah, there's uh, a lot you of notice, You notice that the, that the F word count yes. is quite significant. Very significant. Yeah. But even I think if we attack that, which is traditionally would give us the kind of rating, mm -hmm. you know, a 15 or, or possibly an, mm. an 18, it would still be the overall tone would, would keep coming yes. back. Yes. So I think it's probably going to get an 18. But I, that, it's the kind of movie I don't yes, think, I mean, think, I think it's going to be. That's the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. For this movie, that level of censorship is appropriate. It's that right, right for that audience. It doesn't damage the marketing effort in any way. In fact, it probably helps it. <laughs> The board is a private body and the chief censor works for the industry, not the consumer. He's not accountable to the public. In fact, he's not answerable to anybody except the board's grandly titled Council of Management. And who do you think comprises the Council of Management? Eleven old men, all male, all white, all round about 65 or indeed over retirement age, they're given until they're 70, and all coming from various aspects of the film trade and the film industry associated with manufacturing the product, uh, rental of cameras, the processing of films and so on. And they are the ones that officially, officially appoint and designate those who do the censoring. In its 86 years, the board has only had six chief censors. Most have stayed in the job so long that inevitably the organisation gets cast in their own image. James Furman is no exception. He had a very long time in that job with virtually no constraints, and that's not good for anyone. You know, everybody needs to have some kind of constraints or, you know, their self-indulgent and um, idiosyncratic behaviour can take over, I think. Jim Furman would come in and tell us about you know, his meetings with filmmakers, just like he'd tell us who, you know, other kind of you know, figures he'd met and what have you, and he'd talk about, oh yes, I met Catherine Bigelow at the London Film Festival, and um, she agrees with me wholeheartedly that the um, assault scene in Strange Days has to be cut, and we're working this out. And um, so he, he likes that kind of thing. He likes the idea of you know, being in Hollywood and um, helping, Steven, helping Steven Spielberg cut um, Indiana Jones and the, Last, and the Temple of Doom, for example. So you know, he comes back to examiners like, and here's the children at, at home kind of thing, and I'll explain to them you know, what it's like out there in the real world with like, big grown-up filmmakers and what have you. What has worried those of us in the film industry that have come into contact with James Furman is his needless, almost obsessive secrecy. We had to sign a confidentiality clause um, as part of our conditions of employment and at points in which there were kind of contentious decisions going through the board. Um, we were instructed um, to be absolutely silent about it um, and there were occasions where decisions were taken um, where you didn't even find out about the decision um, and, until, until later, and sometimes by accident. Got, got to pay back. The chief censor would rarely discuss his decisions in public. He was so sure of his own judgment that he didn't see why he should. The board left this former examiner in no doubt about the consequences of revelation when she received this stiff letter from their lawyers. I think the board is secretive because it has such a high public profile and there can be enormous controversy um, around its decisions and the board receives an awful lot of flack and is very keen um, to present um, a harmonious front. James Furman sometimes made idiosyncratic decisions that were hard to understand and which he never really explained. Take the case of a film called Boy Meets Girl by a young British filmmaker. 
What we decided to do was actually to try and write a film and make a film that was provocative that would stimulate a debate around violence in film. In Boy Meets Girl, a man gets picked up in a bar and follows the girl back to her flat. She drugs him, he wakes up in a torture chamber where the rest of the film takes place. The board refused to film a video certificate, mainly because, they said, the victim is as unsympathetic as the morally bankrupt torturer. James suggested that if we changed the ending and had the police breaking in and capturing, um, let's say, our villain as such, then it would be okay. Um, you know, morality would be justified, uh, good would triumph over evil. And um, I, just, I just personally thought this was just ludicrous. And my, my jaw dropped when he actually said this. Neither he nor his, his co-producer really had, had, had visualised the effect the film was going to make. And they thought they were teaching the audience uh, how awful violence was. And instead, they made a film that had all sorts of turn-on elements in it. I, I looked at the film and uh, came to the view that perhaps the uh, board's initial determination had been uh, somewhat uh, harsh. I was of the uh, view that it was a, an intelligent film, uh, perhaps it's a film which failed artistically, uh, but you don't reject uh, mm -hmm. films on that account. And uh, so I advised that he uh, appeal to the uh, Video Appeals Committee on the ground of unfairness, on the ground that there were uh, videos which had been passed and which uh, treated the uh, subject of uh, torture, especially sexual torture, in a much more explicit uh, manner. Filmmakers can appeal against decisions like this, but appeal cases are rare and Boy Meets Girl is the only film the board has given an 18 certificate, then banned its transfer to video. We were a very easy target. Um, if we were Columbia TriStar or Universal, then we could, we could have gone into litigation and taken them on, and we could have forced them to actually justify, in context to other films which they'd let through, why our film was more dangerous or disturbing and why it should be banned. But we couldn't afford to do that, so we just had to let it drop. You caught a glimpse. Brady and his lawyers were given the reasons for the decision. Well, the but evidence. there was no transparency, no details of how the decision was made. You're just the average victim. What one hopes to do is to show that the board has acted inconsistently. One simply can't show the inconsistency since one doesn't have access to the um, uh, uh, the, the report or the reasons why the board did uh, give a classification uh, decision. Ray Brady might have found it useful to consult records of how other, similar films were treated. But in keeping with James Furman's trademark of secrecy, there was no chance of that. It was the um, case that when books are written on the board or when researchers come in, to the board that only the files predating James Furman's arrival at the board are made available to them. So um, files after 1975, which are the files people are interested in, the recent history of the board is inaccessible in that way. I'm 18 with a bullet. James Furman's grip on the board seems secure. Until this time last year, he felt the full force of New Labour's pressure. The reason was a row over classification of hardcore porn. Furman wanted control to be loosened. Home Secretary Jack Straw disagreed. And both Furman and the board's acting president, Lord Burkett, came under fire. Well, I think Jack Straw probably has uh, more views about morals and maybe stricter views about morals in a general sense than, than a lot of other politicians and certainly than previous Home Secretaries have had. Um, but it's jolly difficult to tell really because previous Home Secretaries have not come on strong about anything in particular and they may actually have been um, 
you know, had very strong views indeed without one's quite knowing. This is, I think, a fairly straight-laced government. It's a uh, family values government. I mean, we're not only talking about Blair, who's got an almost religious view of these things, uh, but uh, particularly about Jack Straw, who is the key figure in all this. And Jack uh, is a very conventional, I mean, I think he's a superb Home Secretary, but he has conventional views and, uh, in a sense, restrictionist views on matters of uh, public morality and on matters of censorship, uh, whether it's violence uh, or uh, film uh, and pornography. Lord Burkett was soon on his way he was replaced by a figure more to New Labour's liking, Andreas Whittam Smith, the founding editor of The Independent. Whittam Smith had no experience in filmmaking, but he had a lot of experience of self-regulation in the newspaper business. For his pains, he picked up the nickname Goody Two-Shoes. I do remember my first uh, day, almost. I was asked to look at something called um, Pregnant and Milking Number 5. I must say, it was a complete shock to me that there should be five of these things, this is the fifth one to come up, and that the subject matter was pregnant women stripping, but there was a small market for that. Anyway, rather illogically, I moved it into the R18 category, which means you can only buy it in licensed sex shops, and there it happily remains. I think when Andreas Witham Smith was appointed, he was very keen that he would take ultimate responsibility um, for the decisions that went out from the board, um, and so... It, very definitely felt like there was a shift in the, the, the kind of power balance um, and that the, the, the final decision lay very definitely in his hands. The new president of the board enjoyed political backing and he started to flex his muscles. Like a lot of us, I felt sure that Thurman would soon be following Lord Burkett onto the cutting room floor. All of us have been pushing him for several years and because he's a total workaholic and believes in this job, it's terribly difficult to make him stop. I mean, how you actually turn the motor off, I, I, I don't know. In the end, his job was simply advertised in a Sunday newspaper. It was March 98, and the search for a new chief censor had begun. James Furman made one of his last public appearances as chief censor at a London debate about censorship. We were allowed to film him taking his seat, but true to form, he didn't allow us to film the debate itself. Despite his strong opinions, James Furman seems resigned to how things move on. And there are no right answers. You make the best answer you can at the time, and. I know that my successors, and we have a new president this year, two new vice presidents coming, and a new director. And inevitably, when they get together and discuss policies I've made, they will say, well, perhaps that policy is out of date, and a new policy will come in, or a new decision on a video version of some old film that we've done. Uh, but that's the way things, history rolls on. And, you, know, you can become yesterday's man, man very quickly, that's all right. Months have passed and summer has changed to autumn, but there was still no replacement for James Furman, the director of the British Board of Film Classification, the chief censor. This is uh, the first film that was seen on 1st January 1913, and uh, it's the day the, the board opened for business. And it was a, a, a short film, silent film, of course, 15 years before sound, and most things were you in those days, I mean, you know, very innocent. If you showed a bit of ankle, it was something. It must have been easy then. Oh, I'm sure it was difficult. Wherever, wherever society draws the line, it's, uh, it's difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Mind if I shoot up here? Hey, mi casa, su casa. Muchas gracias. The search continued for Furman's replacement. 
And then, in November 1988, an old film came back to haunt him. So he wants a bigger, he wants one of those old, you know, like big cars. So I don't think we should worry about the driver now, we should worry about the car. I remember the day very well. We were busy getting a new film into production and the chief censor was in the news. He made a speech during a conference about children and drugs. What he said came very, very close to an admission. Radio 4 pounced on the story. Furman admitted the drug-taking scenes in Quentin Tarantino's movie Pulp Fiction may have helped to glamorize drugs. The upside that they show is fixing heroin in, just before he goes off in his car and driving and uh, you know, basking in the warm afterglow of his, his buzz from, from heroin and then going off, picking up a beautiful woman and winning a dance competition. And it's, it's an absolute commercial for heroin. I think with drugs, you're dealing with something really dangerous. And uh, yes, I would hate to think that a decision of mine encouraged even a few people to, to use heroin that hadn't used it before. Strangely enough, it wasn't such a happy ending. I'm a bit disappointed that Jim should feel it necessary now to claw back that decision on Pulp Fiction. He weathered the furore about Reservoir Dogs, which went out uncut, and Pulp Fiction, and he, um, you know, he passed, he passed them uncut on film. To now look back and say, oh, I wish I'd done that, strikes me as rather odd. But, I mean, I can't help but speculate, and it's probably wrong to speculate, that this has something to do with the fact that he's now going out as the great liberal censor, which is something which has always amazed me. I never imagined, in a, all the time I was working there, that when Jim Furman retired, all the papers would be saying, he's this dangerous liberal. Because my impression of him was, he's a censor, he's censorious. I'm a filmmaker, but I'm also a parent. My children are very young, but I already worry about what they will watch on TV and what might be available to them in the future. I wonder what effect casual movie violence might have on them. And it's so accessible. Only one of these underage kids was refused a ticket to see Lethal Weapon 4, a stunningly produced 15 certificate film full of kickboxing, cruelty, guns and blood and, of course, Mel Gibson and Danny Glover. The last film I saw was the X-Files movie. There's something about Mary. My favourite film at the moment is probably Face Off. My favourite film might be The Crow, actually. It's an 18th stuff. My favourite film recently is Saving Private Ryan. I've seen Candyman 1 and 2 and some other ones. Terminator 1, Face Off, um, loads of others. <laughs> All of these are 18 or 15 certificate films. My name's Lynn, I'm 13. My name's James and I'm 13. My name's Kirsty, I'm 13. I'm Becky, I'm 14. I'm Sam, I'm 15. I'm Dan and I'm 13. You ready to order the food as well? Yeah? Okay, I'm a margarita. Sure. Well, I've seen Schindler's List, which shocked me a little bit, because of the fact that it really happened. But um, most of them, you all know, it's just make-believe actors, stunt artists, pretending to be killed or shot or um, shooting people. I've never really seen a film that I've dreamt about badly or anything. It's sort of separated from real life. Because, for example, if you see someone get shot on a film, you know that, like, in real life, two seconds later, they're going to be getting up and walking around again. But if you see someone on the news, for example, get shot, then you know they're probably not going to get back up again. 12 years old, you're at secondary school, you have to get a bus on your own. Are you responsible enough to take control of you? For like, without the money and everything, of your life, what you do. If you don't like that sort of stuff, you don't go and see it. I'm not a violent person at heart. If I see a vi um, violence in a film, I just look at it as violence in a film, not real life.
Hollywood pumps up movies like this, fast cut, repetitive, loud, and extremely well made, where violence is the whole point, the main attraction. Nobody knows for sure if watching violence actually causes violent behavior. It seems unlikely. But I wonder whether today's teenagers are so used to violence that they don't even think what it might be doing to them. James Furman hasn't been able to have any doubts. I totally reject the cause and effect argument. I don't think any film that I can remember has had a direct effect and caused a crime, except possibly, and it's 20 years since I saw it, 25 years since I saw it, Clockwork Orange, where there were a attacks on tramps afterwards, and there were some rapes that appeared to be inspired by that film. And I think that's why Kubrick withdrew it, because it was very embarrassing having all these stories in the press. Now, I've never checked up on those stories, and they may not be true at all. But I think it's much more the drip-drip effect. What Jim Furman prides himself on doing, and what the, what the board prides himself on doing, is being able to tell exploitation from art. Being able to tell films which just threw in violence for the sake of it. Then, of course, all the way through the 80s, you had the Hollywood action movie, which made a spectacle out of action and violence and what have you. And, you know, Jim Furman did not like this. Many of those films were aimed at teenagers, and distribution companies wanted 15 certificates for them. Well, there's more, more profit, obviously, because you get, uh, in the case of 15, three more years of teenage kids, and, uh, and if you're cutting from, from 12 to PG, you can get kids from 5 to 11 come into a PG film, and that's a big audience. The family audience is very valuable. I, I believe with Batman Forever, we gave it a 12, and they said, uh, we want a PG, and we said, well, go, go away and cut it and resubmit it. Um, and they did, and they were nearly there, and we said, well, this, the, these two scenes are a problem, etc. But I understand that getting that down to PG it was worth about six million pounds to them. So that's, uh, that's quite something. The appetite for violent material seems to be insatiable, and James Furman has had to accept that the waves of blockbuster films just keep on coming. But the board has prided itself on being able to turn down some of the material, as much for the commercial interests of the film producers as for any worried viewers. With violence, if, if sequences go on for longer, then there is this idea about process. And process violence, the, the phrase means how much do you, do you actually see on screen of the violence that's taking place. Um, and the, 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 the kind of idea was that the more you see of the violence, the more likely it was um, to, be, to titillate. Um, and so often, if there were five or more blows, then some would be cut. So you just got the idea of the fight, but some of it would be cut. I mean, for example, Terminator 2 had um, several cuts to um, repeat blows. <laughs> For Furman, art house film is a different matter. You don't mess around with a quality film, however challenging the material. It's customary for people to say, enjoy the film you're about to watch, but I think it's singularly inappropriate with funny games. Experience it. Last summer, an extremely menacing Austrian film called Funny Games was a big hit at the Cannes Film Festival. Furman had few qualms. He gave it an 18 certificate. Funny Games is quite interesting because the director was making a serious statement about screen violence and assumed, rather like at the other end of the scale of naivety, Ray Brady was assuming that people would sit in the audience analysing the film morally and saying, it's dreadful, this film is going too far. And Michael Haneke actually said he thought people, the right response to Funny Games was to get up and walk out of the cinema. <laughs> Though I think he'd be dis disappointed if everybody did that. A family arrives at their lakeside holiday home for a week sailing. They get drawn into a nightmare by two young psychopaths who appear to be their next door neighbor's guests. If you buy them, if you buy the golf.
this is what he called his anti-Tarantino <laughs> film. It's a film which removes humour from the representation of violence. It's a film that wants to reach out and make you feel this vicarious violence. But it's also a provocation that puts you on the spot. Do I stay? Do I leave? That's the moment that this film comes alive. And jetzt verschwindet gefälligst. Aber schnell. Ah! Ah! Oh! Is this gebrochen? Most people go to films for emotional experiences. They want to be scared or they want to be moved or whatever. And, and, and it's possible to go to funny games and enjoy a slasher movie. The, the critic in The Big Issue said the trouble is, in, on one level, this is a slasher movie. We wait that he's in. How much time is 20 for 9. That he's in, say, 12 hours, all three are kaputt, said, okay? I would really like to know what the first audience I've seen this film with thinks of it. So if anybody has any comments or questions, who would like to start the ball rolling? What was that if it wasn't packaging violence? OK, he made a statement about it, but it's still the same thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I don't mm. see that it's any different. You still watch it for the same reason, to be scared shitless. What do you think? Do you have a chance to win? You are on your side, right? He is a moralist, the director, and yet... He puts the torturers in a good light. I never beat it. I never beat it. <laughs> they were powerful, they were witty, they were clever with it. A, B, B, and Tos, Pistol. The thing that got me most upset was not the violence itself, but the suspense and the anticipation that worse was to come. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Soll ich jemand was mitbringen? I'd feel secure that after having left the film, that there probably wouldn't be any people in the audience who'd be incited to violence afterwards. <laughs> I found it very powerful. I thought, right, no, he's not going to get me. He's not going to get me. You know, where you said he's going to try and hurt you. Yes. Bastard isn't. He's not you know what I mean? You. He's not. He's not. <laughs> Had to go out for a fag, didn't I? You know? So obviously he did. You know what I mean? It's always an unbalanced decision. And, and on film now, it's a, it's a film, a German, an Austrian film with, with subtitles and uh, about a middle class family being under assault. And. Uh, in a sense, it's a self-selecting audience, and I think probably we felt that the people we w that might get off on the movie in the wrong way probably wouldn't find their way into it. Uh, but who knows? I mean, there can be some dangerous characters around who happen to like German movies. So. But what would James Furman's successor at the board make of a film like Funny Games? At last, close to Christmas, we were about to find out who that successor would be. The news came when, as ever, I was dealing with my own production problems. But as Furman admits, the new chief censor will be dealing with a very different world. I can't imagine going through a week without seeing films, maybe on television or video, because we're all going to have, have uh, cinemas in our living rooms, aren't we, or bedrooms or studies. So that's all going to change. The digital revolution is here. And the internet and videos are going to be on the internet by the year 2000, complete videos. And how my successors are going to cope with that, I don't know. I'm probably the last of the old time regulators. Uh, Robin DeVal, uh, could I speak to Zandra, please? The king is dead. Long live the king. The new chief censor, Robin Duval, arrives at the British Board of Film Classification. The former television regulator must get used to talking to the press, and the old chief censor is conspicuous by his absence. I think, first of all, it's got to be a learning process. Was your role at the ITC very closely concerned with um, taste and decency on screen? And the headline was Channel 4 Liberal <laughs> to be film censor. Congratulations on your appointment. Thank you very much. What you need to notice is that it is all change. I'm a new president. Two new vice presidents have just been appointed. There's a new director. This is a big change to the board after, I don't know, more than 
well over 10 years of having the same people. Jim has done a quite remarkable job. Deval will find it hard to exercise anything like the amount of power his predecessor enjoyed. The clout of President Whittam Smith, more of a political than movie industry appointment, will see to that. Already the board is talking about openness and accountability. I mean, all organisations have had to come to terms with this. I mean, life has changed so that we all have to be much more accessible and open. Uh, and the board has not been the fastest to do this, but now it's quickly catching up. And do you think it'll find it easy? Yes. It's a doddle. <laughs> The new chief censor is on message. What are the accusations of secrecy? You think there is, is something to be counted for in terms of the BBFC's kind of occasionally yeah. sort of uh, uh, contradictory decision making? Well, it, it is the case that the BBFC more recently has, has become more transparent, more um, publicly accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's a choice made by the, the current management, and it's one I welcome. It's one I would wish to build on, because I think increasingly, as, as we move towards the millennium and beyond, uh, the onus on any classification or sensitive organization is to justify itself to the public at large, and it can't do that unless it's as, as open about what it's doing as possible. I was extremely pleased when uh, Mr. Wisdom Smith came in and said what he wanted to do was to make the board more accountable. I think um, that has to happen. In order to justify what the board does, it has to explain itself. It has to be out there explaining individual decisions, etc. The board has moved quickly to adopt the trappings, at least, of accountability. Comment cards, a radio documentary, meet the people evenings the censors who want to be loved. But is it all just window dressing? One of the great problems here is, I think now, at this stage, just before the millennium, I think people know the difference between PR and accountability. I think people really do understand the difference between PR and accountability. Transparency in the decision-making still doesn't seem to be on the agenda. Um, I think that anything that's written and anything that justifies decision reports minutes of discussions that are held over contentious works all ought to be in the public domain for those who are interested. Um, and my own opinion is that archives from the last... Uh, the history of the board ought to be available to any anybody, any researcher who wants to, to explore them. And that would be true openness. Get down! The board hasn't got anywhere near that sort of accountability. But what Whitton Smith has been doing is raising the board's profile. We're going to the annual meeting of the Movement for Christian Democracy. They are a group which takes very seriously uh, the effect that uh, the videos may have on young people. Whitton Smith is obeying rule number one of openness. Go before your critics and invite them to, well, criticise in a very open sort of way. He's meeting a Christian lobby group who gave Furman a hard time. I'm not going to have an uncritical view of either Andreas Whitton-Smith or the British Board of Film Classification. What I welcome is that there's a less combative, arrogant style than there previously was. There's a less ideological style than there previously was. And the openness with which Andreas Whitton-Smith is conducting the BBFC now must be welcomed. David Alton wanted to change the appeals procedure, and he said quite rightly that there was something lopsided about a situation where companies, distributors, could appeal to get our decisions made more liberal, but ordinary people couldn't appeal, saying, well, we were too liberal and we should be harsher. So the compromise which the government put forward after consulting me was that we would set up a panel uh, which would advise especially about children's issues, which is what we have recently announced. Look at me! And I shall also be interested to see how many people are there, because I think uh, it's important to know what is the strength of a lobby group. Is it, is it a big one? Is it a small one? You know, I, I, I have something to learn myself. In the people advising you for the children, all the professionals, I have not heard mention of a priest or any religious uh, influence uh, for the spiritual side. For, the, for these young people. There was a lot of debate uh, 
about this question, both within the board, I also, as, as uh, David knows, I saw a lot of members of the House of Lords and quite a few members of the House of Commons before arriving at decisions. Quite a lot of debate either way as to whether you could make that a specific uh, job category, if you like. Uh, I, my position is that I hope very much that amongst our applicants we'll get very good ones and people who are uh, devoting their lives to the nation's religions. And I'll hope that some, you know, I'll hope that the panel will contain at least one such person. But we'll have to wait and see. Lord Alton is impressed by the openness offensive. Judging by his subtle little nod, he seems to sense a concession on appointments to the new children's panel. The previous administration was conservative by nature and by name. And in fact, they were very hostile to doing anything at all about video violence. And what I think we have in Jack Straw is someone who, because of his own upbringing and background, has a realistic understanding of what life is like in many of our hard-bitten urban communities and what some of the influences are at work, particularly on young people. So you feel that he's kind of working with you very much? Well, it's not that we have a direct alliance. I would probably do him enormous damage if I were to suggest that. No, far from it. I mean, he just has been like a breath of fresh air, though, in, in dealing with these kinds of questions. But who would Andreas Whitton smith welcome to his side? How about Jack Straw's home office? The government made it clear that it wanted tighter regulation of pornography. Now the men at the top have changed, the Home Office has gone deafeningly silent. All it will provide on the subject is this tired old statement. I, I don't think we want a public debate because of the sense that it might liberate uh, inconvenient voices who are going to speak against uh, what's happening, and also because the, our true supporters, if we are restrictionists, I think we are, uh, are going to be uh, raving right-wing lunatics who think that, uh, you know, the whole thing is filthy and therefore it's, it, it's better banned and it's against God's law. Well, you know, there's an argument for that, but uh, the government can't make it and it doesn't want to be associated with people making that argument, and yet those are its allies in the present situation. For years now it's been thought that no government in its right mind would interfere in an individual decision on film censorship. The risks are too great. But one film which after a long delay has just been given an 18 certificate may indicate things are changing and that makes me very nervous. The Idiots, directed by the celebrated Danish filmmaker Lars von Trier, was sent to the board. In the film a group of people act as though they are mentally disabled as a sort of therapy and engage in a full-blown orgy. The combination of challenging two taboos is a potential sensorial Molotov cocktail. James Furman saw it and, as is fairly common, phoned through his decision. It would get an 18 certificate. Apparently, two days later, Furman phoned again and said that he couldn't confirm the 18 certificate because of Home Office involvement. Home Office officials and the board have since denied this, but our source stands by his story. If true, for the first time since the days of Clockwork Orange some 30 years ago, the Home Office has attempted to pre-vet a film. We're in danger of swinging the balance now in this country under this new regime, silently swinging the balance against creativity uh, and uh, towards greater restriction without any debate and without the artistic community or the film community having been heard on the matter. The role of Chief Censor made all-powerful by the singular character of James Furman is not what it was, may even be heading for extinction. The board faces a government famous for its controlling instincts and the board's power is rooted in its ability to control what we see. But in this promised age of the internet and a thousand channel pay TV, Soon nobody will be able to control what we are watching, except for ourselves. It's finger in the dike stuff, you know. I mean, what 15-year-old do you know who hasn't seen Pulp Fiction, hasn't seen Reservoir 
dogs. So what are we doing sitting in that very enclosed medieval society with our own set of codes about what can be a 12 or what can be a 15, when actually in the wider society it means absolutely nothing at all? I don't see this government who, you know, are big on control and censorship is about control, feeling free enough to try other ways to do something about helping young people with the kind of material they can be exposed to. Behind the lace curtains of many British bedrooms, the amateur porn industry is thriving. But what kind of men make the films and why do women appear in them? Boogie Nights in Suburbia reveals all next. Channel 4 has produced a pack of six free postcards and a booklet that looks at how Britain has ended up with some of the strongest film censorship laws in Europe. For your pack, send three first-class stamps to cover post and packing to censored, P.O. Box 4000, Manchester M60 3LL.